All right, I think we've hit critical mass as far as our participants. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Peterson. I'm one of the U.S. chairs of the PSC Southern Panel, and I serve as the Fish Science Division Manager at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you very much for taking the time to attend today's seminar. It's titled Habitat Restoration in a Changing Climate presented by Mara Zimmerman from the Coast Salmon Partnership in Washington and Roger Dunlap from Moachat, Moachalot First Nation. This seminar is part of a PSC seminar series titled Environmental Change in Pacific Salmon Management, the view from both sides of the border. Today is the 15th installment of that series. The series was launched in 2021 by the Southern Panel and Coho Tech Committee to get it started um, in collaboration with the Secretariat and the Committee on Scientific Cooperation. For those of you who are new to this seminar series, as a bit of background, the series is intended to provide the latest information on environmental variation and its effects on salmon across their life cycle. Our approach is to address this variability in salmon management from both Western and indigenous perspectives. These monthly events like today's have featured noted speakers from both the US and Canada to discuss a variety of salient scientific topics. Links to recorded past seminars can be found both on the PSC website and or on our PSC uh, YouTube channel. And if you just go to YouTube and search for Pacific Salmon Commission, you'll find the recordings. I think we have about 14 or so out there. And you may know that seminars such as today's are limited to the PSC family um, as delegates from Canada and the US. But the video links, of course, are open to the general public. And we've had um, quite high viewership of those. So as a preview, uh, future seminars will be scheduled throughout 2023 and beyond. Uh, potential topics include forecasting for environmental variation, how fisheries managers are responding to climate change, including new management strategies, uh, changes in salmon life history and productivity, hatchery and wild salmon interaction, what is and is not known, uh, lessons learned from salmon reintroduction, dam removals, and other topics that the steering committee is considering and, and trying to line up speakers for. So in the near term, we do have the next seminar date already set. Um, we'll, we'll have August off and then in September, on the 20th of September at 2 p.m., uh, the topic will be updates on what's happening around the Northeast Pacific Ocean. And we're gonna feature um, almost like an in-season update on different runs coming in and where we are to that point in time. Um, so we're working on the two speakers on getting confirmation, but that's, that's getting um, nailed down. And then for today, we have a real treat. Uh, our seminar is titled Habitat Restoration in a Changing Climate, presented by Mara Zimmerman from Coast Salmon Partnership and Roger Dunlap of Moacha. Machala First Nation. And so following their two presentations, we'll take a, a short two to five minute break. Um, people can post their questions or thoughts in the chat feature within Zoom. And then we'll begin a moderated uh, question and answer session. Marisa Litz and Mickey Aga will, will host that for us. And we'll be able to address your questions, go into more in-depth exploration at that time. So in terms of today's speakers, uh, Roger Dunlap will be our first presenter with a talk titled Salmon Parks Address Multi-Scale Carbon and Stream Flow Deficits. Roger has worked as a fisheries biologist for the New Chalnut Tribal Council, and more recently, as we mentioned, with the Mochala First Nation for the last three decades in Nootka Sound, west coast of Vancouver Island. Roger served on the Chinook Technical Committee and Sentinel Stocks Committees and continues to represent BC First Nations at the Coho Technical Committee at the Pacific Salmon Commission. 
His research is assessing the geographic applicability of a new spawning residence time index for West Coast Vancouver Island Chinook area under the curve estimation related to migration timing. Roger will present the story of how the concept of salmon parks came to be and how it is being pursued in Nootka Sound by the Mocha Machala and New Hotlot First Nations, along with old growth forest protections and old growth recruitment areas, bolstering depleted riparian zones to age out transpiration, transpiration demands from regenerating forests. And then Mara Zimmerman, as we mentioned, will be our second speaker with a talk titled Salmon Restoration and Resilience on the Washington Coast. Mara is the Executive Director of the Coast Salmon Partnership in Washington and Foundation located in Aberdeen, Washington. She holds a PhD in biology from the University of Michigan, where she began her career focused on the management and conservation of fishes, including salmon. In her current position, she works at the interface of science and policy with tribes, local governments, state and federal agencies, and nonprofits toward a future of sustainable and healthy salmon for the Washington coast. With that, now I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Roger Dunlop. Uh, Roger Dunlop, um, been with the Salmon, Com Salmon Commission for quite a long time uh, on various things. Um, I want to talk today about uh, salmon parks, which is an initiative from uh, the tribes I work for, and how the salmon parks came to be, and what we're trying to address, and what we're trying to accomplish, and what our next few steps are. So, see if I can do this. Okay, uh, <clears throat> that is a map of uh, Nootka Sound and the Mochit Muchlet First Nation territory, and the little inset map is a little green areas are two uh, salmon parks in New Chatla territory that would fit into this section of the map. So yeah, the Moachit, much of the First Nation is here in Nooka Sound. You can take a look at their uh, MMFN 101 on YouTube. I'll leave you to that when you have time. Where Nooka Sound and Nooka Island is where this is happening. And uh, we're trying to secure salmon parks with what I've termed ogres. And these are the beige old growth recruitment cores where we want to see old growth and big riparian area expands on some of the productive forest land. Most of it's uh, converted to, uh, to second group. Uh, the little blue bits are the high elevation, largely old tap deferrals uh, uh, the province of British Korea has put forward. And you can see they're quite fragmented. And if you know the topography here, you'll notice they're all at high elevation generally. So we were trying to take a an area and connect all the wildlife management areas together. But we'll get into those later. Um, <clears throat> and in the end, uh, our, the Mochit Machla Council Chief selected to keep these um, ogres, the old growth recruitment quarters, and the provincial tap deferrals. So we ended up being a much larger old growth conservation area, uh, probably about 28,000 hectares. Um, there's a link to salmon parks you can find there and also a link to a Seattle Times article that recently came out in, with a little bit of a short film about protecting these forests. Um, <clears throat> are the salmon parks vision and objectives were to what we thought originally was to protect about 20% of the landscape because it started over in New Chatlet's Inlet, which would protect like 90% of their freshwater fisheries productivity. They have very few small streams, right? But it turns out that it was close and it's more like 17 protects 90%. Um, letting nature take its course is a fundamental indigenous principle from here. Uh, you might have first heard it with uh, Tsuki, the killer whale L98, when the nation wanted that whale to be left alone. Um, we're going to secure the establishment of salmon parks with legal recognition from federal and provincial governments, and uh, we're developing supporting governance structure based on the traditional laws. That's kind of a separate little project called RELA, which is a process of investigating, much like a legal case file, the contents of indigenous stories that convey laws and uh, values. Um, da, da, da. I'm talking too much. I got to go faster. Oops. <laughs> uh, 
I won't get into it too much, but everybody's familiar with land use issues from ocean and ocean issues from ocean heating, channel disturbances, local disturbance rates, long-term changes in vegetation. Nothing's ever static. Oh, I keep flipping back and forth. And what I'm really going to stress is this transpiration and flow deficits that's been reported recently. And everybody knows about, you know, increased peak flows from logging. Uh, the unfortunate thing is the industrial forestry effects have the same effect on stream habitat as global warming has happened. And uh, we intend to use, uh, address all the causes of our problems. So what we can do, and we think salmon parks are an, op uh, parks are an option that will return watersheds to natural forest disturbance rates, which in some areas on north facing slopes here on the west coast have not had fire or anything in 12,000 years really since the ice went out. Um, you know, south facing slopes have burnt more frequently, but disturbance rates incredibly uh, large, long. Um, we want young forests here because they're all under 50, 60 years. They're starting to cut them again to age to old growth, which means making them over 250 years old with snags and so on, and lots of uh, coarse debris that store and yield and affect channel morphology and put the wiggle back in the rivers that we've lost, okay? So storing water in the soil with carbon in the form of humus is extremely important. Humus directly regulates cation exchange capacity and of course, hyperic water, the productivity of water in the streams. And Given a kick for beavers here, we're trying to reestablish beavers and beaver dam analogs where we can store lots of groundwater for young coho. And you'll see why. So, for, oops, I keep touching that and it jumps ahead. 14,000 years ago, this was all ice and rock. Then we went into sort of Beringia type landscape with sage and willow uh, forests, pine forests. We ended up getting Douglas fir a little bit wetter, and then we went into Western hemlock probably in the last 6,000 years, and that's when cedar popped up and so on up here. And I think we kind of we're headed back to this pine forest future because it's pretty dry out here. Uh, here's just a reference if you want to look at uh, the change from 14,000 years ago from lodgepole pine to Douglas fir to our... Uh, Coast of Western Hemlock Forest, and you can see the old Beringia willows down there 14,000 years ago, which I have a list of references for you to dig into. A couple of big effects in hydrology. We all knew about peak flow magnitude and frequency after forest harvest and channel morphology responses when you took out too much vegetation, whether it's by cattle or by logging or whatever. More Recently, the issue of stream flow de deficits from transpiration in Douglas fir has become to be more important and significant. Um, this is Church's graph of the limits to slope and discharge uh, for channel form from about 40 years ago. <laughs> this is a local example where before a diversion on the Elk River locally, and after the diversion, we shoved that stream into a, a braided channel from a formerly single thread channel where it was perched on the edge. It got a couple of whammies. Um, and what does that mean? Well, we end up losing this large woody debris. So in coho streams, you lose, when that's gone, you've lost half your pools. Uh, the streams start to straighten out, straighten out and straighten out and they get steeper. And so they increase tractive forces on the bed and export gravel. And uh, all that nice fine gravel that was stored behind wood is gone. Here's a local example of one of my pet streams, the Berman River. And I'm just gonna show you a cross section where that arrow is of uh, the channel in the next photo. That's the old channel with six meters. Now, right in the main channel, they're straightened out and it's 60 meters wide, but very shallow. This thing uh, had, a large landslide upstream from the 1906 earthquake, Fomox earthquake, which is a 7.2, and then uh, it got logged. Uh, the new beast in the, on the block is this transpiration deficit in flow. Um, I've been following it for quite a while. I've always have fo followed fish forestry interaction research, and you know, with 
Julia Jones and Perry were bringing this information up. And then more recently, um, Kasten Segura and the folks down in Oregon um, published information from these other waters showing these substantial declines in flow with uh, conversion to Douglas fir plantations. And that's what we've got here. Um, this is a, I can't see it all, but, but this, these are local examples on a log scale. The upper row of dots are uh, 1956 to last year, lowest flows days on the gold average flow. And uh, the lower bunch of dots are from the Elk River, which you'd seen there, but it's in a park. Uh, part of it had been affected by diversion and logging in the past, but it hasn't been, been any logging there. It's largely old growth. And you'll see that the decline there uh, in <clears throat> discharge is only about 10% of the decline in the Gold River, which has been substantially locked. Oops. Phoning me. Hey, uh, car carbon stores. This is really important. So I think I alluded to cation exchange capacity. This was a study on the east and west coast of Vancouver Island and shows you the carbon stores on both sides. So the east side is uh, what we call coastal west or hemlock XM1. So it's the eastern form of XM. It's a xeric marine. It's a marine desert and grows very large trees. But on the west coast here, and this is a uh, VM1, this is our large cedar forest, or what we had as a forest, as I'll show you. And the distribution of carbon in soil, detritus, you know, debris, and uh, living trees. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see, there's much, much less carbon in the region and the immature forest than there is in uh, old forest. And they're, here are their categories. They're calling, you know, mature forest over under 100, under 100 years when, in fact, mature forest here you know, doesn't even start to develop lichens and nice characteristics like that till later. But anyway, snags and woody debris in that old forest and this carbon store water. And not only that, they facilitate cation exchange. So mineral soil doesn't retain nutrients or water unless it has humus or carbon in it. So I'm sure you guys know that. And indigenous example was the Amazonian raised beds of pottery to protect charcoal uh, from being washed away in the Amazon. And there's areas the size of France, France that were uh, gardened like this. And the entire point of uh, capping it with pottery is to protect that chiodon exchange capacity and the humus. So we have this huge productivity deficit in these forests once they've been logged and we've washed away a lot of that humus and soil and the so on. And uh, we don't have that nutrient reservoir anymore. We're back to very sterile streams. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, so we think healing the forest and its governance of the hydrogeomorphic process was going to take centuries. These are the, the forests, the biology, climatic, ecological classification variant system. And the territory extends from Nootka Island here in the low fog drip stuff, this green dark stuff where the characteristic is uh, evergreen berry. And then you get into the red cedar VM1 and then a little higher up VM2, which is a transition into yellow cedar and amabilis fir. And then here we have our coastal marine desert in the Gold River Valley, big tree XM2, Zirk marine area. And then over to the east here, we have a lot of stuff in high elevation in the parks and alpine areas in mountain hemlock and a bunch of other stuff. So when you take a look at this, uh, I was trying to change this graph to make it in order because this shows east reversed with west. But the western area that's subject to forest harvesting are within this red square. So the outer fog drip zone, you can see most of that is now under 250 years. And uh, VM1, which is a uh, ah, red cedar leading forest out there, the biggest of the area of 117,000 uh, hectares, uh, about 80% of it's been logged or more. And then in the VM2, which is then transition from red to yellow cedar at higher elevations, uh, they've knocked off about 40% of it and then about a half of the big tree, a little bit more than half of the big tree uh, in the green summer desert here. So that's the state of the disturbance on the, the salmon producing area. These 
zones over here are at high elevation and to the east and do not are not salmon producing within the nation's territory. They're mostly in Strathcona Park. This is a fish habitat risk assessment tool we develop, much like the Pacific Salmon Foundations. Uh, this is just one shot of maximum equivalent clear cut area, which really doesn't have much <laughs> to do with fish production. Um, some studies have shown um, a little while ago, but you can see our salmon parks correspond with these high elevation green areas largely. Some of them the information is missing and our other park down there. <clears throat> some of them, of course, have been intensely harvested. But... So this is how it all all started was I was asked to go take a look at this creek in Oesta. It was the Taihut was last one stream that wasn't logged and is only sockeye stream with a little lake. It's a spring run. And that's his son walking up the creek in ahead of us. But if he was over a little bit more, it would be over his head under that spanning log, the hole there. And as you can see, there's no uh, gravel bars, exposed vegetated banks. But you see the sunlight, that's where the wind throw occurred, where they cut too close to the stream and opened up. <clears throat> and an observer and forester would have known the old old debris there was all aligned that way because of the wind, but it happened. So we got to talking and we just were sitting around like, uh, why don't we just say no? And the chiefs agreed, let's say no. And then uh, anyway, <laughs> you said no more logging. Actually, they went uh, to Supreme Court over this to stop it. And what was most stunning about the walk up that creek that day was this pile of chum salmon bones on this piece of wood, six inches above the water in March, I think it was. And they hadn't been washed away because the river doesn't break, break out into floods. It's an old growth stream and it's just like a huge sponge. It soaks up the water and lets it out slowly. Anyway, it was just amazing that, that that's the way it used to be everywhere here. Uh, salmon parks were declared under new channel of law by the chiefs. Our challenge is recognition by the provincial government. <coughs> um, and we have some help. We have a... I've been writing to the letters to the province quite a bit about forestry and the nation's rights for the last couple of years, and I've got their attention now. And we have this new opportunity that is Canada's commitment to protect 30% of Canada by 2030. It was 20 by, I think, 20 by 25, but now it's 30 by 30. And uh, Canada and BC have made a nature agreement, and uh, the ministers have been giving uh, been given a mandate by the premier to uh, actually protect 30% of the turf by 2030. So we're going to use that as a key and as a solution to uh, some of our ailments that <clears throat> we're not seeing well, which is, you know, rampant erosion of the roads and no restoration efforts to control sedimentation in salmon habitat and uh, the destruction of culturally modified trees which people can use if they know how to identify them to protect habitat, right? Because in Canada, if they predate 1846, they're protected by law and you can't harm them. So if you find them along a nice stream, no one can harvest them. So the parks again, the pink areas that kind of corresponded with a lot of those old growth areas, they're not all, but largely high elevation and by coincidence, Maybe not. Um, I realized that the First Nations settlements were actually centered around these particular locations, the Liner River, not Tassus. Tassus is a tiny little creek, really. But the Liner has high elevation ice. Um, the Upper Old does. The Berman River and some of the other ones um, don't have as much, but they have much productive ground. Um, other productive ground. We were trying with these old growth recruitment corridors to within this big area that's you know heavily dependent on logging, uh, connect as many of these little wildlife management areas. And you can see them, they range from tiny little parks to old growth management areas. And there's two types of old growth management areas or augments. One is spatial, which is legislated, it doesn't move. And then there's the, the logging company's forested stewardship plans where they can move them around every five years in their stewardship plan, which is kind of odd. But then anyway, we're trying to peg them down um, 
Um, and we're going to eventually slowly go through each landscape unit, landscape unit by landscape unit, and make adjustments so that we can correct things like um, ungulate winter ranges in the wrong places and things like that. Um, so overall, the territory um, <clears throat> outside of, of the parks, about 12% of the land was protected by um, various what they call constraints or restraints on logging, like um, riparian zones and setbacks and so on, and adjacent zeros and so on. And in 1917, the province declared Strathcona Park, the first provincial park in uh, British Columbia, and it stood there, and uh, the nations haven't been had access really to that park in that time, um, which is amazing. There's a huge archaeological record of uh, culturally modified trees and stuff to find there, which we're exploring as well. But here, you can see the light green on the left is the Moachit much of salmon parks. We figure it would take 17% of their territory. It turns out it's about 48,000 hectares in total. And adding on those recruitment corridors would add another, you know, 18 to 20,000 hectares. Um, all being said, with the existing parks, existing uh, wildlife management setbacks, our recruitment corridors or ogres would actually protect nearly, uh, I think, what is it, 68% of the land base. And, you know, a lot of that is high elevation stuff. It's in the, in the park over there. It doesn't affect salmon, but we'd substantially increase. So we would be going way beyond protecting 30%, but closer to 60% percent or more of the land base for, for other values. Um, we have uh, <clears throat> a company that did some work for the First Nations Caucus and the Salmon Commission Southern Fund recently on uh, the values of salmon and uh, earth economics is actually, uh, uh, I've written a contract for them to investigate the non-timber values in these areas and report back what what other services and what they're worth are coming out of these streams, and including salmon. Um, oh, how come I've got this over? Okay. So what's next? We're going to continue to raise awareness of the salmon parks idea, um, like we're doing today. Um, the nation's working to reduce the annual allowable cut and controlling more of the timber supply. So we're planning on reducing the rate of timber cut. But being the dog that wags the tail, which is a situation in with the Ministry of Forests, where uh, the logging companies basically say what's going on, and they just kind of go along with it. So we want to do that, and then the behavior on the landscape will be improved. Um, we're looking at multiple mechanisms to develop the necessary legal protections. Um, <clears throat> Working with Ducks Unlimited, we set us we uh, mapped out a bunch of estuaries and surrounding area for protections that link to our ogre corridors, and uh, we're pursuing with Water Land and Resource Stewardship Ministry the um, initial steps so that we can find an appropriate path forward for these, and probably in what we're actually really looking for is Forest Act protection by legislation. And that's going to require retiring you know, commercial logging rights because we have to bring the cut down. We're involved in the timber supply reviews and so on. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we have a website, salmonparks.ca. It's, it's pretty bland right now, but it is being grandly updated with a lot more information um, shortly. We did a big branding thing, and that's how we got this logo. It started out actually with an evil eye and it was just horrible that eye just kind of followed you around and made you feel guilty like you didn't you had to get rid of that and change it. um more next steps uh working with bc and canada and other partners on these and uh revision of the local land use plans to protect and recruit recruit old growth forest to respect title and rights um we have a meeting set it was actually to be set for tomorrow, but we got another minister involved, so it's delayed till September. But we're meeting with Minister Nathan Cullen from Walrus, uh, Bruce Walsh Ralston from Minister of Forest, and the uh, Minister of Indigenous Reconciliation, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, Mur Murray Rankin. And we'll have them all three in the room and be able to deal with our stuff because I'm going to offer up. Um, we have 
we can assist them uh, in achieving their mandate of protecting land. We're ready to go on this and uh, so on. And it'll address you know, some of our concerns about erosion and uh, sedimentation of fish habitat, culturally modified trees, and a big one, which is cumulative effects, which you can see by how much of the forest has been removed here in the, in the past 50 years or so. Um, we recently put together a proposal to Environment and Climate Change Canada's Nature Smart Climate Solutions Fund. Um, we got lots of other projects underway from setting up temperature monitoring networks, archaeology, beaver recovery, all kinds of stuff. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in addition to the benefits to ecosystem processes, fish and wildlife, and so on, these uh, forests will store carbon to help address climate change. And we know that we can, you know, store up to 1,600 metric tons per hectare of carbon there in this area, which is where it can, the highest storage rates can be around here. Um, oops, acknowledgements. The, the First Nations and the Tribal Council we work with, um, I've been involving BCIT restora eco Ecological Restoration Master's uh, students to come out here and work, and I've had three of them out here working on uh, forest cover removal and hydrology options and uh, beaver modeling and stuff. And uh, I hired my old boss from the tribal council as a project manager. So he's got a guy now working on this half time, Eric Angel. Um, and we've been given funding by the Sitka Foundation, Nature Based Solutions, um, lots of support from the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Association and uh, Matt at Ducks Unlimited, but I think they're ducks and beavers now because they're planning on replacing a lot of their hard structures in British Columbia with beaver dam analogs and such. Anyway, um, funny how that propagated. And here's the references for anyone who wants to dig into those papers that I mentioned. And uh, that's it for my talk. I hope I didn't go over time, but this was originally our. Uh, going to be our logo that a local artist drove but <clears throat> he had one thing wrong these are all keystone animals here that orcas quiatsic or the wolf um <clears throat> uh to the beaver which we were talking about but this sea otter is supposed to be upside down and have a shorter nose and a tail <laughs> so he looks more like a river otter but they're here too and there's a picture of, of a local chum salmon oh Thank you. Excellent presentation. Really interesting, Roger. And now we'll turn it over to our second presenter, Mara Zimmerman. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mara Zimmerman, um, and I will be talking about salmon restoration and resilience on the Washington coast. So I will, I'm going to start by giving a bit of background, both orienting you to the Washington coast and to the Coast Salmon Partnership, and then dive into sort of the content of this presentation, which is environmental change and habitat restoration. Um, this is a map of the Washington coast region. Um, if you are in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, you are to the north and east on this map. And if you are in Portland, Oregon, you are to the south and, and east on this map. Uh, the Washington coast region includes all watersheds that drain directly to the Pacific Ocean. It has a fairly low human population, about 200,000 throughout the entire uh, 3.75 million acres of, of land. Uh, six federally recognized uh, tribes, all with uh, reservations. Uh, and the land use is primarily forestry, but also agricultural and rural residential uh, land use. The Washington coast is known for the diversity of salmon, char. There are 118 populations of salmon and steelhead, 12 of coastal cutthroat, and three independent populations of bull trout. Two of those species are uh, listed under the uh, US Endangered Species Act, Lake Ozette Sockeye and bull trout, um, but declining numbers of uh, salmon and steelhead recently have led to a petition uh, to list um, e Olympic Peninsula steelhead and Washington Coast Spring Chinook under the Endangered Species Act, and those petitions are currently being reviewed by the National, Fisher uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, the Coast Salmon Partnership is a, the salmon recovery organization for this part of Washington state. So salmon recovery organizations in Washington state are formed by state statute. There are seven of, it, seven of them. Um, so Coast Salmon Partnership serves the uh, Washington Coast region. 
We are formed by interlocal agreement amongst tribes, counties, cities, and port districts in these areas, so tribes and, and local governments, uh, governed by a board of directors with representation from each of the four coastal watershed groups or, or what we call lead entities, and I'll give a little bit more information on that in a moment. Importantly, the, the, part, the Coast Summit Partnership does not have any regulatory authority. We uh, facilitate collaborative decision making in support of salmon, salmonid restoration and sustainability within the region. And many of our partners and board of directors work for governments or organizations um, that do have regulatory authority and can take the information that's exchanged and, and uh, work with it, as well as um, organizations that are heavily engaged in voluntary restoration work. There are four uh, watershed groups or lead entities on the Washington coast. These are more uh, local, uh, um, and so four of them within the Coast Salmon Partnership, also formed by state statute. Um, and these have representation from the local tribes, counties, ports, non -co um, conservation districts, nonprofit organizations in each of these areas. Importantly, um, there is representation at both a technical and citizen level and their committees um, set up this way. This is a um, specific way that Washington approaches salmon recovery where the, uh, that will sort of follow the theme of my talk and uh, where both the input um, to making decisions about actions is both um, influenced by uh, technical input as well as um, local knowledge and local, local input as citizens. So these, the lead entities specifically are responsible for establishing funding priorities and implementing on the ground community supported salmon recovery projects. So that's a little bit of background for you, sort of the, the um, habitat restoration world and, and, and framework in which we work, as well as to the Washington coast in general. So environmental change. So I, I pulled out some of the, you know, my pretty pictures from the Washington coast uh, to, make a, to make a point. Um, it is a very beautiful place. It is a place where many people come to recreate. It is um, the probably the best last available uh, salmonid habitat in Washington state. However, I um, sometimes hear folks talk about the Washington coast as having pristine habitat, and that is just not true. And, and so I wanted to provide a little bit more um, perspective um, uh, to you uh, this morning in terms of thinking about the changing environment of the Washington coast. So we have a legacy of environmental change that has been heavily influenced by timber and by timber harvest. And so beginning in the late 1800s, early 1900s on the so southern part of the Washington coast um, began an extensive uh, timber harvest on the landscape where um, hillsides were, were logged down to the streams. There were no requirements to, to save riparian buffers at that point and large dams called splash dams built on the rivers because they needed to move the logs to market. And so um, the the water was the way to transport the logs downstream. The splash dams for fish would cut off migration routes um, and scour out wood and, and, and sediment downstream of these locations. We've, we've documented at least 235 splash dams on the, in the, on the southern um, part of the coast uh, during this period. By the middle of the 1900s, um, the, the mode of transport it changed to rails and road building. And we also had um, the initiation of much more heavy timber extraction also on the North Coast. And the picture on the right-hand side of the slide is shows you the um, depiction of the rail system that was set up on the Quinault Indian Reservation by the federal government to um, provide access to harvest the, the timber on, on the reservation. Um, and so the, the footprint on the landscape was um, was was uh, quite quite noticeable. Over time, there have been regulatory protections and legal um, requirements put in place that have uh, changed the way that that timber industries have been interacting with um, the watersheds and how they implement their harvest. Um, in 1946, by state law, if you harvested trees, you had to replant trees for the. 50 some years before that, as we were harvesting trees, there was no requirement to replant trees on the landscape, but that changed and we now have tree farms where at least we're sort of replanting um, what was taken. There have been major changes to forestry practices starting in the 1990s to improve riparian buffers, fish passage, and sediment delivery rates on both federal and state managed lands, as well as tribal uh, lands where they have their own forest management uh, practices. 
There's also been legal requirements for, for changes that have benefited salmon habitat. The US v. Washington culvert case, which went all the way to the Supreme Court in 2017, requires the state of Washington to repair and replace state-owned culvert fish barriers. This comes at a very high cost, $4 billion um, estimated, um, with a 2030 deadline. So it will make this will be a substantial lift to the um, extensive um, disconnection of streams across state-owned roads that occur um, across the landscape. Of course, state-owned roads aren't the only place that streams cross, and, and we'll get to that issue uh, in, in a moment. In addition to the, the, the types of environmental change mentioned there, um, we have climate change. And while we often talk about this as something that's going to happen, it's been happening for a while. Um, on the left hand uh, slide of here, you have a picture of the Anderson Glacier, which is in the headwaters of the uh, Quinault uh, River Basin, which is all but gone at, the, at this point. So glaciers in the Olympic Mountains, which are the northern part of the Washington coast, have reduced um, their biomass by 50% in the last 100 years, and they are projected to be gone by the end of this century. This has effects on um, the stream flows, stream temperatures, and on salmon habitat. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see that there have been changes in the freezing elevation and in precipitation that falls as snow um, on the Washington coast. And this is specifically from information uh, on the, in the Olympics, which is the northern part of the Washington coast, where the freezing elevation has increased nearly a, th a thousand feet in seventy year, last 70 years. And the precipitation of snow has decreased by 13% in the, in the last um, 70 years. The consequence of all this is that our streams are warming, our summer low flows are getting lower, and our winter high flows are getting higher. And all of that affects, constricts salmon habitat and trout habitat, salmonid habitat in the summers, and it um, scours uh, reds, it affects channel migration and channel uh, formation during, during the winter months. So, enter um, the sort of thinking and uh, work done with habitat protection and restoration into this changing environment. So um, the first sort of point I wanted to make is that in addition to the protections that are set up um, by regulations, which sort of set up a process for passive restoration, meaning we put up, we, we uh, require trees on our stream banks um, in um, uh, commercial forest lands. And over time, those trees will grow large enough to shade the streams and to uh, fall into the streams to create channel complexity. The existing, um, uh, research that has come out of the Washington coast suggests that that passive restoration is not enough. And the authors in looking at what is happening to streams in second growth forests where, where riparian buffers are required, concluded that, that those conditions are unlikely um, to increase salmonid production in the near future and really recommend um, in, incorporating active restoration into the recovery planning. So that would come in the form of fish passage, riparian restoration, floodplain reconnection, stabilization of high erosion or high channel migration rates. So I'm going to talk about three areas of or three initiatives or three strategic areas in which the Coast Salmon Partnership is working to sort of move this active restoration along. And remember that we're, we're um, the work that we do is sort of providing the, the guidance or um, um, and uh, technical framework that many of our restoration partners can then pick up and, and implement. So the first um, area of work is with, with fish passage. Um, so the problem is that we have road systems that have disconnected and fragmented our stream networks. And it's not just state-owned roads, it's all roads that streams flow through. We currently have more than 3,000 known fish passage barriers remaining in the Washington coast region, even with all the work that has been required on uh, uh, timber, commercial timber property to correct their fish barriers. Um, and these impacts affect not only adult access to spawning habitat, but also juvenile access to cool water refugia, high water refugia, depending on what season, and sediment and wood transport that, that create downstream habitat for, um, for salmon and steelhead. So solutions, the Coast Salmon Partnership has been working across the Washington coast with the different uh, watershed groups to prioritize fish passage um, efforts. So way too many uh, fish passage barriers to uh, work with all at once. There's not enough money. There's not enough capacity. Where do you start? 
So on the Olympic Peninsula, this effort is uh, termed the Cold Water Connection Campaign. It is a collaboratory effort between Coast Salmon Partnership, Wild Salmon Center, and Trout Unlimited, both of which are uh, NGOs that are working with us on this uh, effort. Um, it is also done in, within a collaborative effort with the tribes, counties, and others who work um, doing restoration work um, on the Olympic Peninsula. So the Cold Water Connection Campaign is specifically focused on the northern coast of Washington or, or, or the Olympic Peninsula. What we do have done is to score, we pull together uh, barrier databases from state and federal databases um, and score those barriers based on habitat quantity, potential connectivity, future condition using GIS information. So too many barriers to visit them all in the field. Let's model it and identify priority tiers that then can be visited in the field. And so then our project partners go out and do the field verification to develop projects for the high priority or tier one barriers. And the map on the right, those big purple fat dots are the ones that come out as being the highest priority. And those are the ones that are currently being looked at and or advancing to uh, project uh, implementation. So this is a solution that we are applying uh, throughout the, the coast. Um, just to explain a little bit more about what, how we have done this scoring process, what we do is pull together GIS information, not just on the amount of habitat in, uh, available, but on multiple questions related to the ecological gain that might be associated with opening a fish passage barrier, such as what is the habitat potential, as in the geomorphic potential of that channel? How many species currently use the habitat? What is the condition of the habitat, both at present and also future climate projections? How severe is the barrier and what kind of stream connectivity exists upstream or downstream? Is there a complete blocking culvert downstream? Um, that's gonna make a difference into what, how much of a priority a given fish passage barrier is. And then we work with the, the um, local work group to say, okay, here's the data now. What do we think about the relative importance of these different factors in terms of their benefits for, um, for this project as a fish passage barrier? And that's where the combination of the technical, which is like, what's the data, and the, and the um, professional opinion and, or in, in local knowledge of the folks that are working in the field to say, if I was gonna put together how much habitat and how many species use the habitat, here's how I think about it. And it leads to some very interesting conversations, which ultimately rely, relay in this little pin wheel on the right, which is how we ended up weighting all the different um, scores uh, for um, all the different data that went into this ecological gain score. Another nice thing about this work is that we can then articulate goals. And so in looking at the Olympic Peninsula, for example, the cold water connection campaign, we looked at the um, the uh, benefits of, and the priorities of the different fish passage uh, sites that we had identified, as well as the capacity of project sponsors to, to address those since we were all kind of working closely together. And we've identified a goal of 50 high priority culverts in 10 years that would add to the WASHDOT, which is the state owned uh, fish barrier corrections that are required by the federal injunction. In accomplishing this, we're reconnecting uh, or improving connection to 125 miles of stream habitat or 42% of the currently uh, blocked habitat on the peninsula. So this kind of articulation of goals has been extremely helpful to raise both private and public funds to implement these projects. So this is the first initiative that we've been working on um, strategically to try to get restoration work going on the ground. The second area I want to talk about is watershed scale restoration. And um, the, the issue here was really raised in a recent report that was put out that focused on uh, management implications from the Pacific Northwest Intensively Monitored Watershed uh, Program. This is a program where habitat restoration has been coupled with fish monitoring. So we actually get that answer we all want, which is, are these actions making a difference? And what the team concluded in synthesizing all this information, um, I kind of provided a quote from the lead author there, which is that we are not consistently doing the right things in the right places. And so specifically, some of the management and policy recommendations that came out of this report um, kind of identify some of the problems when we sort of try to do watershed scale restoration, which is the recommendation to build restoration plans um, at watershed scales, rather than thinking about this project here and that project here, thinking holistically. 
prioritizing restoration methods, not just based on biological impact, but also the certainty of success, kind of the effectiveness of the, of the work. And implementing restoration actions at continuous landscape scales, this idea that cumulative actions are far more likely to result in a positive response um, from the fish populations. So these recommendations were recently laid out. And, and as we are working in the, on the Washington coast region, we've been sort of tackling this at a, um, how do we put together prioritized watershed restoration plans in select watersheds um, that will allow for a lift for the fish populations, not a project here, a project there, but collectively make a difference. And so this has been guided by a white paper that was developed by the Coast Salmon Partnership, um, but the planning is done by watershed specific groups that include both co-managers and stakeholders that are knowledgeable about that local watershed. So we have both the technical and the local knowledge kind of working together to make these uh, programs successful. Um, these, this is intensive process-based restoration at the watershed scale that addresses impaired processes. So once the groups talk about and, and identify impaired processes in the watershed, which might be things like um, uh, too much erosion or a lack of shading, um, uh, lack of connectivity, then we model, uh, we model data that identify priority reaches that can, that can address those impaired processes through a series of actions. And I'll give an example of that in a moment. Again, we're using the model data first to help narrow down where we wanna focus our efforts. That model data is based on uh, GIS information. And then we use field assessment verification work um, in work collaboration with the different partners involved in the planning um, to focus on those priority reaches and develop a specific projects. So an example of sort of how the modeling might work here would be, let's say that the, uh, in a, the, in a, we, that the work group has identified that shading or stream, um, not shading, excuse me, that stream complexity or floodplain con connections are um, lacking in the basin um, based on past, the past uh, use of the, of the landscape. And so the action that would help to, um, uh, address this would be to place in-stream wood in the channel while, while the um, riparian areas are healing and, and growing. It um, takes 100 years to grow a 100-year tree, right? Um, and so to identify where to do this in-stream wood placement, we are, are guiding that with information, several different types of information, um, which kind of combine where is the best salmon habitat, so kind of species distributions, what locations are the most feasible for access and engineering? So, you know, what what's, does the hillside, hill slopes look like distance from road of that reach? What does the channel width and stream power look like? Is how heavily engineered would a project need to be or not, which is gonna affect its cost. And then what's the wood, what, where will wood activate habitat forming processes? So where in the, the um, which stream reaches are most likely to respond to wood once you put it in? So if we put this information together across the landscape spatially explicit, we come to a wood placement score, which answers the question, where are the best opportunities for wood placement? That helps guide the work going forward uh, within the watershed. So for example, uh, the New Wacom River, which is one of the, the initial um, watersheds included in the prioritized watershed restoration program. This is a, a map of the, the um, treatment area here. And there's, you know, 100 miles of stream if we put it all together, far too many to sort of cover and identify for field verification, where do you want to do projects. Using the um, wood opportunity model, we're able to narrow down the areas of focus to fewer areas in the watershed. And now teams are out doing the field assessment and identifying where would be the best places in these reaches that by the model say, these are good wood placement place, um, places for wood placement. What do we see when we're out there? Where is the landowner permissions um, present to do the work? And um, where are going to be the best places to do these projects based on what we see on the ground? So the um, goal for these pilot watersheds with this program is to generate a list of actions that, that um, is of sufficient magnitude that it will generate a measurable lift 
in freshwater salmonid production. And so we can talk about the actions, but then we can also say, based on our best understanding of available science, about 20% of the watershed would need to be restored in order to result in a measurable fish response. And so that's what this looks like in this water in this watershed, that the areas with the highest wood placement scores, top 20% of the areas are these areas. And this is where we should focus to uh, develop uh, projects, be they riparian restoration, invasive plant removal, be they road drainage, storage decommissioning projects, be they in-stream wood placement projects, depending on what the, the action is that's needed, um, it would look a little bit different. But we can talk about the actual goals in terms of, of miles of habitat, in terms of um, uh, uh, types of actions. So this is the, the, the second sort of concentrated effort or strategic effort that we're taking to really try to, to guide uh, restoration work within the Washington coast region. The third is a climate adaptation framework, which is also very related to the topic of our seminar today. And so one of the problems that we face as a region is everybody knows climate change is important, or most of the people that we're working with who work within salmon recovery think that climate change is important. We have climate vulnerability analyses, those are generally understood. There are several that exist for the Washington coast region, but what we need are climate adaptation strategies. Like how can we increase resilience? What does action look like? And so that's really what we've been trying to tackle and we're sort of midway through this, this uh, process at the moment. I'm trying to translate available science in a way that identifies the connection between climate impacts, such as increasing summer stream temperatures, decreasing summer stream flows, increasing winter peak floods, rising sea levels, increasing coastal erosion, connections between these things and habitat and protection, act, re, protection and restoration actions. So there's sort of two phases of this work. Um, one is, had, was, had really been focused on the projects themselves. And so we want to promote habitat protection and restoration projects that incorporate climate impacts on salmonids and on watershed function. And so, work to put together a reference guide that, that makes specific recommendations based on the types of projects of how project sponsors could think about the impacts of some low summer stream flows on their project. And they can look and see what's the projected projected changes for those that area of the watershed based on the, the best information that's available. And then what are the recommendations as to how they might address that with a, or how they might adjust their project, if it's a culvert project, if it's an in-stream wood project, if it's a riparian project. That is actually, that part of the, the phase is actually completed. There's a, a report um, that sort of lays all that out for project sponsors. We've actually, we've also done a fair amount of outreach kind of talking with um, each of the lead entity areas or watershed groups about, uh, about how to implement this work. The second phase of this work is to identify where we have the best opportunities. So this is at a watershed or a HUC hydrological unit code um, 12, HUC 12, which is kind of a small, small watershed, uh, maybe on the order of 50 square miles. Um, where, where do we have the best opportunity to improve climate resiliency of salmonids through habitat protection and restoration? And so the, the um, approach here, and where this is, we're really sort of in the middle of this at the moment, is to think about climate resilience and measures of climate resilience that reflect exposure. So what is projected to change? Summer stream flows, summer stream temperatures, sensitivity, how the, the um, watershed responds um, to or experiences that change in summer stream temperature. A watershed that has um, more intact riparian will have more of a buffer in terms of to radiant heating with increasing summer stream temperatures than um, a watershed where there is no riparian buffer, for example. And then the third element, which is a social element, is adaptability. So what is the willingness and receptivity to make the changes that are needed to um, respond to the changing climate and to respond to the need for watershed health? Um, so to do this, we've pulled together uh, spatial data sets. We need spatial data sets that have scientific support for each component. So we've kind of gone through our process there and also are consistently available for the entire region. So in some cases, for example, like we know that wildfires and increasing wildfires are, are um, a, 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 a concern for the future, but there's no uh, predictive model of 
where wildfire vulnerability would be higher or lower. I um, mean, so that's not something we that is not something that we would have included, whereas there is quite a bit of information about land cover and land use with respect to forests and wetlands and uh, road densities that we're able to tap into, as well as the projected climate change uh, elements themselves. So as an example here, just to sort of explain to you how we're thinking about this, I put together um, a map that sort of rolls up at that HUC 12, that watershed scale, um, the uh, predicted change in winter peak floods by the end of century. And so the areas that are lighter color um, are the ones that are projected to have more change. And so you can see these the, in the area that is um, in the top right corner here, this is the Olympic Mountains, large changes are, pro are projected for peak floods in that area. In addition, these coastal areas are also projected to have quite a bit of change in uh, peak floods, including well into the uh, Chehalis, well inland within the Chehalis River, which is this large river system that sort of wraps around here. So these are projected changes. Um, how sensitive will the watershed and the landscape be to these changes? And so one of the metrics in the literature that, uh, that interacts with um, peak flooding and erosion is the road densities in valley bottoms, where more road densities are more sensitive um, and, and, and uh, to peak floods and area and watersheds with less road densities are less sensitive. And this translates into lower um, egg to fry survival in some species. And so uh, what you can see is that this area that's in the Olympic Mountains in, that is projected to have quite a bit of uh, change in peak floods, actually has fairly low road densities. So in other words, it is, this is not an area that, this is an area that is fairly well buffered, as much as buffered could be, uh, or resilient, if you will, um, to the projected changes. However, if we look in um, the, the coastal areas that are projected to have um, fairly large increases in, in uh, peak floods, these are areas where there's actually a pretty high uh, level of, um, road densities that are within the valley bottom and valley bottom is within 300 feet of the of the stream channel. So in this case, these areas both have projected changes and they will be highly sensitive to those changes. So this is the kind of information that we're pulling together um, in this climate resilience index um, that, that we are developing. The adaptability piece is a social one. Um, for this one, we are um, taking a slightly different approach. And so we have gathered local work groups on both the northern and southern part of the region. And we are working with them to categorize our land parcel data by land type. So kind of pulling together land use and land ownership um, information to, to develop land type categories. So it might be agriculture or private forest land or conserved forests, for example. And then as knowledgeable about their watersheds and as knowledgeable about the regulatory compliance and voluntary receptivity uh, to restoration work in their watersheds, we are asking the local work groups to score each land type based on that knowledge. And so we will be asking them to for each land type that they have developed to score the compliance or, or effectiveness of existing regulations with respect to protecting salmon habitat and to uh, score the receptivity to voluntary restoration um, on that land type. And you can imagine that that might change quite a bit both be in the two different geographies of the coast, as well as amongst parcel types. Commercial forest is gonna have a very different answer to that question than agricultural land, for example. So some takeaways I hope um, that you take away, that was a lot of information, um, but there's sort of some key points that I hope you walk away from this presentation with um, and, and um, maybe for some discussion with respect to uh, Roger's earlier presentation. The first is that um, forest management has a large footprint on the Washington coast. It's at least 82% of the land is, is managed forest in some respect, either from preservation to um, you know, 30 year rotation uh, timber harvest, but it's, but it's forest as opposed to other land types. Current regulations and policies for forest management have been underway for more than 25 years, and they have reset the trajectory for watershed health to what it was in the early 1900s. That's not saying that it's perfect, but if you look at where we were and where we are, there, we are definitely moving in a, in a more positive direction. Active restoration is underway in the form of fish passage and in, in 
the form of watershed intensive restoration programs. And, the, and these um, watershed scale work has have determined priorities combining both the scientific analysis and local knowledge. That is sort of a, a key way that we um, do business on the Washington coast, but I would say also throughout Washington state, that has been the approach to salmon recovery. And lastly, um, climate change intensifies the need for watershed health. We, the best thing we can do to help a watershed be resilient to changing climate is for it to be as highly functioning as possible. Now, climate change is like, it's both certain, like we know it's gonna happen and it's uncertain. It could take a lot of different forms. And so there's that element to it, but what everything that we do know says watershed health is the key. And in particular, resilience of salmon and their habitats will require this combination of ecological and social solutions. We need the social willingness to do the work, to comply with the regulations, to voluntarily plant trees on your land when it's not required, um, as well as to, to do the, the right ecological things um, to build, rebuild the watershed health. So uh, that is my... Um, message from the Washington Coast. And um, thanks for, for listening. I'd be happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Thank you, Mara. Wow, tremendous uh, presentation, so much helpful information. Thank you so much. So I think now um, is time for a quick break. Um, Marisa, what do you think, five minutes or? We can, well, so it's 3.12, now we can take about three minutes and we three can minutes. resume for at 3.15 and um, encourage everyone to put their questions for Mara and Roger in the Q&A box um, so that we can have some, some great discussion. All right, three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, folks, so we are back with the, um, Q &A, uh, and A, and our first question is for Roger, and it comes from Gary Morishima. And uh, Gary is asking, what are the goals and objectives for salmon parks? And also, what criteria and methods are being employed to measure um, and report progress? Okay, can you hear me? Me? Yeah. Okay. Well, I actually showed you some of our objectives right now. We're more of in a support, outreach, and establishment phase of gathering support to actually put this land aside politically and uh, allow the area to recover or these areas. We're also we'll be doing you know monitoring recovery of road because we're going to have to remove a lot of the logging roads that are out there. Um, and so on. So really, we haven't set the program up, but it's being thought about and how the government's government structure will be developed. We do currently have some fish monitoring programs, counting salmon going on in probably half of them. No, actually all of them. And uh, except for one or two on Nutka Island. So those uh, will be able to track any increases in salmon production, but this is a you know, a long-term venture when we know, you know it could take 500 years for a Douglas fir to mature and die, and then it's got to fall over to affect a stream. And we're 500 years or 450 years away from that point. But um, those monitoring measures will be developed and we'll have some way of reporting back. But uh, I was kind of joking with the people from the Seattle Times is that we need someone who's going to look back in 100 years and see if we did achieve anything. So I'm sorry, my question, my answer is pretty empty, Gary. Thanks, Roger. Uh, so we have another following question up for you, Roger, with the uh, higher than average number of wildfires in the recent decade. Have you or First Nations evaluated the potential effects of forest fires on salmon park formation and, and maintenance of corridors on lands of the Moshat and Mushalat? Uh, um, interesting. We just got two inches of rain. Uh, we had some fires burning here. They're not normally. And I lived here for 30 years, and I'd say in the last 
10 at the most that we actually have seen any forest fires. And uh, we haven't planned for them, but uh, as you probably realize by looking at those graphs, much of our lowland productive forest has been converted into flammable Douglas fir plantations. And it can have a huge effect. I mean, um, there are big problems from forest fires in the interior of BC. You know, it causes erosion payment, pavement. You know, when we have this, especially these droughts too, at the same time, when the water comes, it doesn't penetrate the soil. It just runs off, especially if the humus has been eradicated by the fire to, you know, intense fire. So we haven't planned for it. We, when we see a fire go off here, we just kind of watch the helicopters go by. They're on the mountaintops and uh, we haven't done any, you know, formal planning of that sort. Good to think of though. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. So for Mara, um, we have a question for you. What, in your opinion, are the biggest hurdles for habitat restoration? And what are your suggestions for overcoming these? Yeah, um, I think it has changed over time. So uh, it, it, it probably varies from place to place too. So I'm gonna talk specifically about uh, the area that I work in, which is the outer coast of Washington. Um, and for a long time, uh, the answer would have been funding. Um, so this area, because we don't have um, or haven't had ESA listed species, a, a lot the portion of funding that we would get to implement work um, was much less than other areas of the state. And that has sort of a cascading or has a circular effect, right? The amount of funding affects the, the amount of capacity to do the work because it's like it's how many people are involved and how many people are involved reflects how much work gets done. And so it, it kind of circles on each other, right? So that has definitely changed um, over the last uh, five or six years. Um, at first at the state level, um, there was a, there's been a significant investment specifically in the Washington coast called the Washington Coast Restoration Resiliency Initiative by the, by the state legislature. And um, that has allowed larger, more complex projects because now um, we have larger amount of money to work with and, and it's allowed more projects to get going on the ground. It's also changed more recently with the federal infusion of money under the, um, IIJA, sorry, infrastructure, inv uh, the, the federal money related to the bipartisan infrastructure law in uh, Washington, uh, in uh, the United States. And um, we have been able, because we had put work into sort of trying to strategically develop these fish passage strategies, we've been able to tap into that federal funding and make compelling arguments as to why that funding should, should come to this area to reconnect the, the streams. And so, Funding is um, maybe not the limiting factor at, at this point. At this point, it's we're a bit behind the curve, <laughs> right? The, the funding kept work from happening, which means that now, um, you know, getting the work going and then waiting for the fish to respond and then adaptively managing to that response, we're kind of just beginning where a lot of places have been for um, 15, 20 years in, in Washington state with respect to um, implementing stuff on the ground. So I would say that um, it's more um, at this point, um, we're, we're behind, we're behind um, as, one, as one limitation. Um, the other um, main limitation is, um, willingness to engage. So restoration work is, is voluntary. So this is not a financial problem. It's a people need to give permission for you to do work on their property. And for some folks, that is um, something they really want to do. Um, they sort of see the benefit of it. And for other folks, like it's a, it's a hard no. And if it's a hard no, it's like, we're, we're kind of stuck, at least when we're talking about voluntary restoration. We're talking about regulatory protection, that's something else. But with respect to voluntary restoration, um, we need the, the uh, support and engagement the public needs to value um, floodplains, beavers, trees on the riverbanks, and um, educating the public and, and, and sort of instilling a generation of folks who have those values is, um, is, is it's a very real need. Thanks, Mara. Uh, this is sort of a follow-up question to that, and I believe you, you maybe answered part of it. 
Um, what are the best ways that the general public can support the Coast Sand Partnership and active restoration efforts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, land stewardship is a big is a big one. Um, you know, stewarding. So, um, folks who have land on rivers um, being uh, willing to sort of ask questions, um, find out what might be possible. You know, um, work with people to um, you know. Are there trees on the riverbanks and the stream in your backyard, <laughs> right? In the, the forest lands, there are. But if I were to show you a land uh, use map of the Washington coast, which actually I pulled out because I was concerned about length there, the river corridors, that's where we all live, right? We timber in the hills, we live in the floodplain. <laughs> Is all residential and agricultural lands, we need trees on the bank. So steward your land, get involved in, in um, helping your land to be environmentally healthy for the water, as well as for however you're using that land. That would, that would be a, that's a, that's a big one. Um, supporting salmon recovery in general through, uh, your vote through voting for legislators who support this work, who support bringing uh, public funding to the Washington coast. That's another way that the public can help. Thank you, Mara. All right, back over to you, Roger. So um, question about, uh, I mean, this impressive work on salmon parks that really was spearheaded by the Nechuma First Nation. Have other First Nations reached out? Um, have you engaged with any other partners? And, and can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Sure. Um, I was actually, when we came up with this concept, me and this Tai, I can't mention his name because he's passed away. But we came up with this content. We were, it was just pre-COVID and we were hoping it would become contagious. And uh I had quite a, a few invitations by uh, to make presentations to the BC First Nations Fisheries Council. Um, I was invited to speak at the, hopefully I get this right, the International Gathering of Indigenous Salmon People um, in Vancouver last year. So Sami people and, you know, people in the north and other continents, Kamchatka, now know about salmon parks. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think people think it's a good idea, but you know, in British Columbia, the the policy that needs to be changed is uh, liquidation of every tree in the timber harvesting land base, and that means the policy is to remove every tree that you can reach, right? Unless it's in a park. So that's where the whole issue is, and you know, I admire trying to. <clears throat> go in there and do rest stream restoration, put pieces of wood in there. I've done it and I've gone back 30 years later and God said, we didn't reduce the rate of cut. We put wood in the streams. We didn't rebuild the riparian zone. There's no wood recruitment. So that's what pushed me towards salmon parks. And like I said, I'm not going to be around to see the results. Somebody asked, you know, what's my hope for the timelines? Well. <clears throat> I'm 63, so I hope soon. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, for actually the functional response and the restoration could take thousands of years. And why I say that, and when I showed you those slides of the changing and the evolution of the vegetation here, I really think these stream channels in this region were set during that montane climate when we had lodgepole pine forest and you know that is it's desert right it's dry as heck and then precipitation gradually increased and we got bigger and bigger trees but the root strength was able to keep up with it but then when we cut it now we're in this era of higher peak flows those little stream bank trees can't hold humpty dumpty together again once they've been pushed into that braided form and that's it you know, it's going to take a long time to put all the convolutions and put the wiggle back in the river. So I'm thinking big scale, you know, you can do those little projects. But if you don't deal with the dragon up there and where they're logging now is where the hill slopes are steep and directly connected by dra gravity to the stream channels, right? And then goes right in. So that's why we came to this idea of salmon parks. They got to deal with the whole processes. The, 
whole hydrologic process and only the forest can govern that properly we can't <laughs> it's pretty evident but david far too long of an answer <laughs> Thank you, Roger. That was really nice, actually, to hear. Uh, this one, going back to Mara, how does the framework for Washington Coast take uncertainty into account, particularly given the long-term focus? There are multiple sources, such as tipping points or sudden extreme events that have potential to substantially change the expected effectiveness of restoration efforts. Yeah, that's like the, um, you know, important important but really really um you know the quite probably the question on a lot of people's mind so the, the in in thinking about this to the extent that we have and it's sort of an evolving um process the, the idea we we need to act now in fact we needed to act a long time ago <laughs> but, but we need to be think uh kind of moving forward with what we know now and making the best decisions about where we invest um the the effort and energy now and that's what we're hoping to get out of this framework is sort of where are the areas that are more or less resilient and what are the actions that we need to take to improve resiliency in each of these in each of these watersheds that said we also need to share and look at track what's happening there's not a huge amount of uh, um, funding or um, capacity available for monitoring and without sort of trying to kick up some giant monitoring program sharing what's happening tracking what's happening on an annual basis what did we learn this summer we have extremely low summer flows what are people seeing at their project sites what have we learned does this tell any, us anything about what we would do different? So that sort of idea of without sort of creating a, um, you know, unfunded and, and can't be supported with capacity monitoring program, could we take the observations that folks are making, discuss them, share them on an annual basis, and decide if there's changes, are there changes needed? Um, was the initial framework we put together completely faulty right i mean at this point we feel like we've got something that that that's worth going forward but in in 5 10 20 years um it, it might look like something different um so that's sort of been the approach that we're taking um and uh yeah i guess that'd be the way i'd answer that thank you mara excellent well, thank you so much to our uh, two presenters, Mara Zimmerman, Roger Dunlop, and our uh, hosts today for our PSC seminar series number 15. It's time to close for the day, but again, um, if you'd like to view the presentations again or have your colleagues do so, uh, they will be out on the uh, PSC YouTube uh, site. So feel free to go out there and see them again and, and draw on these resources that really can help us all in our own uh, organization. So thank you so much once again to our presenters. And don't forget, we have um, our next seminar will be in September, the 20th of September at 2 p.m. with an in-season update approach on how our salmon runs are doing in the Northeast Pacific to, to that point in time in 2023. So really looking forward to that one. And uh, thank you all for coming and taking the time. Really appreciate it. And for the Q&A um, discussion points, really good questions. Take care. See you next you time. Go. Catch a fish, everybody.